Hi there, me, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke salter. So today we're going to discuss a bit of a controversial topic, toxic positivity. Yes, those people that want to say, hey, just be happy and it'll all get better. Um, unfortunately, you folk aren't so helpful. And we're going to discuss toxic positivity. So again, like any of the videos I'm going to do, just to show I'm not a talking head, um, all the research I've accumulated for this video is listed down below. And you can find it there. So, doing for the research for this video, it took a while to do, a little bit longer than normal, mainly because this concept of toxic positivity is so new. Um, the reason behind this video, some of the stroke support groups I belong on Facebook, you see all these posts, hey, nothing depressing here, we're all here for support, you know, we only want good vibes. Well, yesterday there was a post someone said something and I had I had to respond that what you were saying is is shaming like you are shaming someone out of their emotional authenticity right uh, and we're gonna get into that so there's a PhD at Harvard so if this individual isn't suitable enough for those of you that are gonna say that I couldn't find an expert well I don't know what to say her name is Susan David she's done a TED talk Right. She's a, a psychologist on the faculty at the Harvard Medical School, an author of the book Emotional Agility. And she says this, when we push aside difficult emotions in order to embrace false positivity, we lose our capacity to develop deep skills to help us deal with the world as it is and not as we wish it to be. The conventional view of emotions as good or bad, positive or negative, is rigid and in this rigidity, we face, and in rigidity, in the face of complexity, is toxic. We need greater levels of emotional agility for true resilience and thriving. So, that's a small paragraph which basically sum up the entire video. For those that are done watching, you tune out now. Um, you can just stop watching. And for those of you that want to hear me continue this line of thought, please stay tuned. So part of this whole self-care positivity culture, what are you doing? Comes out of social media in a way. That whole hashtag good vibes, hashtag blessed, hashtag you know positive thinking, hashtag sunshine, all that, all that stupidity, right? It, it's cliche, right? Instead of demanding that we you know talk about what's authentic, what's real, people are demanding that we be positive and I'm positive this bird is about to pluck more hair so and it creates a culture where people are expected to constantly be happy constantly have a smile and they're not entitled or allowed to have a bad day or express a bad thought oh um you know just I'm gonna go get some magical fairy happy dust and I'm gonna sprinkle it on you and magically you're gonna be happy and your problems are just gonna float away well what happens when you go to a friend um, and I've had this happen to me someone who I considered a friend um, and then after that day I essentially cut them out of my life um, sadly I work in the same building as them so I have to see them every day but that's nice um, this individual said to me when life hands you chicken shit you make chicken salad and I was about two and a half months after my stroke I was on my chin strap that day and I was looking for someone to actually provide some help, right? And I realized this individual doesn't have the intellectual nor emotional capacity to actually be anything but an emotional bully, right? That, that's where that ends. Um, because you can't make someone be happy. You can't make someone be positive. As, as much as in that moment where I wanted to be positive and I wanted to be happy, I was dealing with my body and my brain not getting along well enough. Um, I'm dealing with my neurologist had just written me off from three months to six months, and, and I'm sitting here trying to piece this all together. Right? So more often than not, when people come to you and they're having a bad day, they're actually looking for some validation. They're actually looking for someone to, to get down in the trenches with them, right? Show a little bit of empathy, a little bit of courage, and, and try to be in the moment with that individual. Would you tell someone that has cancer, fuck, just get over it? Just, just, if you wish it away, it'll get better. 
would you tell someone who's diabetic, you know, just get over it. You don't need your insulin. Just eat less pineapple or whatever, right? So toxic positivity has some negative impacts, right? It's shameful. If you were to try to tell someone who has anxiety, depression, an eating disorder, schizophrenia, right? Any form of major mental health issue. If you were to tell them, hey, just get over it. Oh, think happy thoughts and the world will get better. Well, it doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, you're going to get people that are going to say some stupid things like, oh, you'll get over it. Just be positive. Good vibes only. Stop being so negative. Oh, think happy thoughts. Never give up. Just be happy. See the good in everything. You know, they're, they're not dealing with the realities of your situation. They're dealing with the platitudes and the bullshit that they wish to spew. You know, according to two studies that were published in Motivation and Emotion, which is the official journey, journal for the Society of the Study of Motivation, never heard of them before, I'm not so not familiar with them, um, the push to think positively in order to have some magical influence on a happier state of mind will have dire and significant consequences. Researchers, researchers have discovered that people who engage in the opposite People that lean into those negative emotions, right? So you're going to embrace that negative emotion. You're going to give it some validation, right? And you're going to do it in a way where it's constructive. We'll get into that in a minute, right? So people that actually lean into the negative emotion instead of just trying to slough it off and push it aside, fare better and have more positive outcomes than people that pretend that everything's perfectly fine, just be okay, right? This isn't a, you know lie back and think of England moment, right? So when people acknowledge and address their negative emotions towards their relationship or chronic illnesses, it helps them adjust with their behavior and have more appropriate responses. Moreover, people who think emotions are easily influenced and changeable are more likely to blame themselves for the negative emotions they feel than the people who think emotions are fixed and out of their control. So right there, you're having a bad day. So I'm just going to use a stroke because that's my best example. Um, there are days where I don't like where I'm at in my life at times. Like I have to have someone help me put on socks. Just think that one through. You're a fully grown adult, fully formed human, no major physiological deficits, no neuro, no muscular deficits, no structural deficits. Up until the 21st of June, socks were not a problem for me, right? I didn't have an issue with socks. Um, after the 21st of June, socks pff, could be, you know, traumatic. Um, just attempting to put on socks could, you know, take 20 minutes. Tying of shoes. Like, so that can get pretty disheartening. When you think about it, when you're trying to deal with the fact that you're dealing with your brain and your body don't like each other anymore, right? So you've had a brain injury, be it acquired traumatic, you've had a stroke, right? You've had some other form of neurological deficit, or, you know, you happen to have depression, you have anxiety, you have any, any major mental health issue where you're going to have shit days, right? So research has also come to similar conclusions back in the early 2000s. When people expect them not to feel negative emotions, they end up feeling more negative emotions. Well, if you're in a, an environment, get up there. Well, if you're in an environment where you know people are going to want you to put on that happy face and smile and be all happy, cheery, and, and you know, puppy dog sh sunshine and rainbows, right? Well, you're going to take your reality and you're going to have to push it aside just to make someone else happy for what, two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours. Forcing people to use positive statements such as I'm a lovable person or I'm beautiful or I'm smart can actually make someone feel more insecure. Visualizing a successful outcome under certain conditions can make people less likely to achieve it. Um, people in a negative mood produce better quality and more persuasive arguments than people in a positive mood because right? apparently negative moods can improve memory. If I want to work on my memory, does that mean I stay in a negative? No, I'm not doing that. Um, positive thinking can become a way of avoiding necessary action. So if I'm 
always thinking positively, right? At that point, I'm actually working on the actual issues that I'm dealing with. I, I don't think you are, right? Not only that, research on emotional suppression shows that when you suppress your emotions, you push them aside or you ignore them, they get stronger, right? If you're not able to actually embrace the emotion uh, and, and, and accept what it is, it's going to percolate, it's going to ruminate, and then eventually it's going to explode, right? Psychologists call this amplification, right? You might think you're in control of the unwanted emotion because you're just going to push it aside, put it in a box, lock the box up, stick it under your bed, shut the door, right? And that's where that emotion is going to live. And you're never going back to that box. It's just bottle it up and just, just, just move on. Well, the problem is this. You haven't addressed the emotion. You've only cordoned it, contained it, and then just pushed it aside, right? Um, and then eventually that internal pain from not effectively dealing with, resolving with, expressing with, owning and accepting that emotional state will eventually have significant detrimental impacts and effects on the people around you, your relationships, your workplace, whatever the case may be, right? When you label your emotions accurately, you're able to define and discern the emotion. You can then define and discern the cause for your feelings. And it's when you can identify why things are happening, what in your life is going on to make you feel that way. You have a higher, what they call readiness potential, right? Allowing you to take concrete action, concrete steps to deal with that state of being, right? Whatever that emotion is, right? And that helps you not only just take random steps in the correct direction, but the right steps for you in that time and place. So, your emotions are are, are, are data, right? Um, your emotions are a reflection of where you are in time, place, and person. Your emotions are an indicator of what you like, what you dislike. Are you agitated? Are you not agitated? Being and having an emotional state is actually quite healthy, right? It's when you start having ineffective or inaccurate states of action that relate to your emotions, right? So when I worked with young offenders, I used to do anger management counseling. And one of the first things we'd have to teach them is having the emotion of anger is completely acceptable. It, you are completely allowed to be angry. However, when your emotional state of angry becomes into a state of action, that being anger, and, you know, the hitting of things, mainly people, um, that, that's not allowed. That's not socially allowed. That's not um, legally allowed. Right? You, you just can't randomly start hitting people. So, once you start understanding that your, your emotions are kind of like traffic lights, right? You got your green for good, let's go. You've got your yellow for caution. You've got your red for warning or stop, right? Once you accept the fact that your emotional state are like traffic lights, then you can start to realize if you get that caution signal, right? Why are you getting that caution signal? If you're getting the hard stop, why are you getting the hard stop? It all depends on why that is happening, right? And, all, and then you once you can realize and accept your emotional state, you can then take the appropriate avenues to make sure that your state of action your st doesn't negatively impact your state of being, that means your emotional state. Right? Now, here's some things that are food, th food for thought. When you paint over your true emotions, you make it difficult to create, foster, honest and open relationships. So. And I'll go back to the incident where someone told me basically, you know, stop looking for a pity party, get over it. When life hands you chicken shit, you make chicken salad, right? Well, I was trying to be present and truthful in my actual emotional state that, you know, I'm in a shit state right now. I need some help, right? Um, I was trying to be open and honest. And that person didn't have the intellectual capacity nor the emotional capacity to be anything but a bully. Right. Um, and, and because of that, I've just basically that person is 
dead to me, essentially. So, if you always have to go into a situation knowing that the other person is just looking for sunshines, puppy dogs, and rainbows, well, you're not having an honest relationship with that person, right? You're not you're not able to have an honest relationship with that person. So you're not actually having a relationship with that person. You're placating them, right? Encourage yourself and others to be honest and defining in how you're feeling, right? Again, there's nothing wrong with being able to have ownership and agency over your actual emotional state, right? There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's significantly more healthy to be able to identify where you are and, and put a name to it. Because if you can put a name to it, you then have better ability to deal with yourself, other people, and the situations around you, right? An acknowledgement of the truth allows us to consciously choose a response. If I can put a name to my emotion, it now allows me better ability to choose a course of action, whatever that course of action is. Right? But the more the more important piece to that is you are responsibly taking the time to be honest, to be open, to be intuitive, and, and put a name to how you're feeling. And once you can put a name to how you're feeling, and I'm not talking about, oh, I feel hungry. You know, I'm not talking about, oh, I feel sad. I'm talking about, I haven't eaten in 10 hours, so I am hungry. Right? Um, or, you know what? The last three days, I've had to have someone help me get dressed. I'm feeling kind of depressed and dejected, right? You, so you're going to label the reason why you feel that way. Right? And for those of you that want to be the emotional bully, right? do not force positivity on yourself or others. You want to work on validating all emotions, right? An emotion is an individual unique experience. When you, when you validate the emotions of, of either yourself or others, you increase your ability to constructively deal with the situations in the moment as they are, not as you would like them to be. Right? You get to deal with them in, in, a, in an authentic manner. You get to deal with them in an effective manner. Right? And ultimately, you have to make a decision of emotional courage. Right? What do I mean by that? Someone comes to you looking for help. You have to take the time to decide to help them. You then have to take the time to check yourself and decide, am I going to offer the help that I think they need? Or am I going to simply ask them precisely and clearly, tell me exactly what you need. Tell me exactly what I can do for you. So you're not making assumptions that don't apply to that individual and you're just going to try to find your own personal band-aid or plaster to apply to the situation. Right? So for those of you out there that have experienced toxic positivity, right, you understand what that can be like, right? how belittling it can be, how shameful that can make you feel, um, how you've now realized the other individual that's done it just isn't there for you anymore, so you're going to kind of be in, in a manner not really wanting to have them around anymore. I, I completely appreciate that. And if you like what you've been watching over the past, coming on 10 months in just a few days, uh, please like, share, subscribe. If you know someone going through their own post-stroke journey, please point the channel out to them. If you know someone supporting someone going through their own post-stroke or someone going through a post-stroke journey that's providing support to them, please point the channel out to them. And if you happen to notice someone who appears to be going through the signs and symptoms of a stroke, that being someone who appears to be befuddled, confused, uh, their loss of orientation in the place they're in, uh, someone who has uh, difficulty with their vision, they can't see it in one eye, they see in grayscale, they see through a little dot in the world, um, someone who has facial droop, inability to raise both arms equally effectively or at all, uh, inability to smile equally effectively or at all, uh, slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word usage for situation or context, someone who has general body weakness, weakness on one side, inability to stand unaided, please immediately place them in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.